All right, hello and welcome for a podcast episode here for Age Civil War on this going to be a new format. We're going to try out and see how this works out. Um, instead of the written interviews, we're going to do a conversation. And for my first interview, I am joined by Frank Cirello, who is a graduate of the University of Virginia where he looked in his dissertation at the abolitionist movement. And we are going to talk today about the abolitionists with regard to his new book that came out in November of 2023, The Abolitionist Civil War, Immediatist and the Struggle to Transform the Union. He has been in a lot of different places, including... Yale University, a postdoctoral fellow at New York Historical Society. He had spent a year in Bonn, and he will be a postdoc at the University of Michigan in the coming year. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, Frank, and congratulations on your book. Thanks for having me, Niels. I'm happy to be here. Great pleasure. Um, so, Frank, tell us a little bit about how did you come to First of all, write a dissertation about the abolitionist and then to turn that book, that dissertation into a book. And so it all came about originally uh, with my master's thesis. I uh, went to graduate school at the University of Virginia, where most things are Thomas Jefferson all the time, every time. So I thought uh, sure. there would be an interesting approach to talking about Jefferson would be looking at uh, Jefferson in memory. Uh, specifically anti-slavery memory, how anti-slavery reformers talked about Jefferson and, you know, the antebellum and Civil War years. And as I got into that, I found myself less interested in the Jefferson aspect and more interested in the abolitionists themselves. Uh, I thought, you know, they're really interesting. And there's actually kind of a big hole in the scholarship here. There's there's a lot done on abolitionists you know, in the antebellum years, 30, 1830s, 40s, and 50s, but kind of leaves off at the Civil War itself. And I thought there's there's a gap that I can I can fill here. Uh, so that did become the basis of my dissertation, uh, which came out, which was uh, published in 2017. Uh, and, you know, like most people do, I spent a fair amount of time revising it, doing additional research, uh, found a whole slew of really interesting materials at the Library of Congress, the New York Historical Society, and elsewhere to kind of burnish uh, my findings and, and dig a little deeper. And uh, yeah, that, that became the book. Wow. Yeah. And like, that's a fascinating kind of direction that you, you saying like, oh, let's look at abolitionist memory, which I think is a perfect topic too, which really we need more work on as well. But then you end up with this hole and you're like oh that's something else i need to fill um so let's let's get one of the formalities of sort of these interviews out of our way and what what is the argument that you do that you have in your book what's sort of the the, the punch line of your book yeah so i'll get into the definitions of you know what i mean about abolitionists and other things later but just in terms of what the, the you know Basic argument is I look at the, the transformation of the abolitionist movement during the years of the American Civil War, so 1861 to 1865, and how the movement had a momentous effect on both you know the nation at large and on abolitionism itself. So I look at how these abolitionists, these anti-slavery reformers, really overhauled, really transformed entirely their, their cores, beings, their very identities to, to intervene in the war and become these political actors in the war, Union war effort. And by doing so, they really helped transform the Union war into a war for freedom, into a war for emancipation, but they only at the cost, at the consequence of really shattering and, and weakening their ability to achieve, achieve and secure post-emancipation Black rights. So you know, the way I sum it up is that uh, abolitionist actions help explain how the Union War achieved both so little and so much in terms of justice for African Americans. And it's it. Uh, that was one of the aspects that was really fascinating about your book, um, just sort of in general, is that we always think of the abolitionists as sort of like it's a success story, right? Like 
13th Amendment, mm. Emancipation Proclamation, and you're kind of complicating and saying like, yes, but um, why have we never thought about this? Why would why why are we so tempted always to kind of just like you know we we have all this conversation and criticism in the U.S. of like oh historians always do the dark side and the bad stuff and like when it comes to abolition we always talked about the good side and only the good side it seems <laughs> like um, you're kind of really correcting think... that. <laughs> I'm oh I'm I'm trying to um, I think. <laughs> Part of it is, uh, you know, historians like the Dunning School were so anti-abolitionist for so long that it just we needed to remind everyone that they actually were not the bad guys in the story. Uh, so just, you know, presenting them as these unadulterated heroes kind of made sense as a reaction against that. But mm -hmm. I think it's also partly a product of, again, I but this book doesn't talk about abolitionist memory, but it is a, kind of a passion project of mine to look at that stuff after the war they they all wrote memoirs talking about how they were the heroes in anti-slavery struggle and it really caught on with this the in the people who were fighting for civil rights the people who were opposing segregation looked up to the abolitionists as heroes so i think that narrated their narrative was perpetuated and carried on into our present day and i mean i don't i don't mean to say that they didn't accomplish a great deal they, they did but there, there was a cost and a consequence of that, and there, there were flawed because you know they, they were human beings like all of us. They, they, there were consequences to what they did. Sure. Um, so let's talk about abolitionists, and um, so it seems like we have a couple of different groups that we're looking at because um, your your title suggests we're looking at the immediate abolitionists. So that's your Garrisonian group primarily, but then you also divides that further into what you call moral purists and interventionists. And then you like you like have new layers in the middle of the war all of a sudden that these groups break further apart. So let, let's yeah. let's stay with abolitionists and sort of the in, initial groups, the kind of moral purists and interventionists. How do you define all of these guys? Yeah. So I'll I'll start off by defining what an abolitionist is. So in my book, uh I talk about immediate abolitionist, abolitionist, and immediatist interchangeably. Uh, all all it means is uh, they're immediate abolitionists as opposed to gradual abolitionists who were around in the decades before. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is, I'll, I'll talk about the traditional factions, Garrison and the people opposed to Garrison. But just for how I define the abolitionists, they're they're generally you know James McPherson and his really seminal work on abolitionists. During the war years uh, from the 1960s, uses really three main definition, three main criteria for how to define abolitionists, mm -hmm. uh, and I believe in all of them. One, they believed in immediate emancipation, so emancipation has to end now and unconditionally, as opposed to gradually sometime in the future. They believed in some form of rights for African Americans. Mm -hmm. Now that meant a wide variety of things. For some people, it meant full political and socioeconomic equality. For some people, it just meant former slaves would just stay in their plantations and labor for nominal wages. They would be free, but you know, not free to move around. Uh, but this the fact that there was some place for African Americans in the post-emancipation United States distinguished them from people who believed in colonization and just mm -hmm. sending African Americans away after freedom. Uh, and abolitionists were not part of mainstream political parties. So mm -hmm. I draw the line it's uh, distinguishing abolitionists from people like uh, radical Republicans, like Charles mm -hmm. Sumner, or Daddy Stevens. These people believed in black rights. They believed in media emancipation, but they were part of a mainstream political party with a moderate mm -hmm. center of mass. They had to hew to the party line and not adhere, not uh, advocate these beliefs a lot of the time. Whereas abolitionists said, no, we are not part of these mainstream parties. We are above the fray and we don't pollute ourselves that way. So those are the three typical definitions. I add a fourth. They believed in a, that the, the current union was imperfect, uh, mm -hmm. was corrupted, and it was their job to make it a morally transformed union, to make it perfect and make it uh, you know a beacon of democracy. Mm -hmm. We'll talk more about that a little later. So the, yeah, There's the a lot of things we want to talk about <laughs> because there's so much absolutely. in your book. <laughs> it's, yeah. It is a lot. <laughs> I agree. Uh, 
So the traditional factions that we talk about uh, in the scholarship, which are mostly the antebellum factions before the war, you've got your Garrisonians and your non-Garrisonians. Again, all of them are immediate abolitionists, immediatists. Uh, the main difference is over the Constitution. Uh, the Garrisonians believe the Constitution was pro-slavery and they wanted a disunion, a temporary disunion, so that uh, essentially the South would be bereft would, would lose the protections of the federal slave code and slavery would somehow end. And then, then the nation would reunite on an anti-slavery basis. Again, very idealistic, not uh, very, you know, practical, but their, their point was we want to, the, they don't want a permanent uh, sundering of the nation. They want to redeem the union and make it good and anti-slavery. Um, then uh, that's people like William Lloyd Garrison, uh, Wendell Phillips, Parker Pillsbury, and the non-Garrisonians, like Frederick Douglass, uh, is the most famous example of that, uh, believe the Constitution was anti-slavery, that you could work within the current political system, um, and that you shouldn't be part of a mainstream party, but you could create your own pure anti-slavery party to achieve change within the current system. So these are the, the traditional factions, and they were the defining lines of abolitionism from its founding in the early 1830s. Uh, into the late 1850s. But things started to change in the late 1850s. Uh, abolitionists started to get really frustrated because they're just seeing victory after victory for the slave power, right? They've been fighting for, uh, you know, almost 30 years and it doesn't seem like they're winning. It seems like they're losing uh, from uh, the, you know, compromise they're of frustrated, right? And this Nebraska, yeah. Uh, Dred Scott, they're, they're really, really frustrated. Uh, and they feel like they've failed their old tactics of just, you know, using, you know, purity, standing aloof mm -hmm. and trying to appeal to the people with these high minded moral appeals is not working. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these abolitionists, uh, both Garrisonians and non Garrisonians, uh, the biggest names are people from both factions. So William Lloyd Garrison and Wendell Phillips from the Garrisonians. Also, Frederick Douglass from the non Garrisonians, a major rival of Garrison. They start to say, well, Maybe we sh instead of just, you know, sticking to using pure moral means to achieve our moral ends, maybe we have to use whatever instruments we have at hand to achieve change however we can. So and one of those instruments by the late 1850s was the Republican Party, which was not an abolitionist party. It was moderately anti-slavery, wanted to stop mm -hmm. the expansion of slavery, not to end slavery itself. But they thought maybe maybe these Republicans will be useful in our fights. So maybe we can kind of have very tentative and very, you know, low key, but some kind of engagement with them and not, not just totally shun them. So these people are what I call the interventionists. They're most abolitionists. And then there, but there's a small group of abolitionists and these are mostly like the hardline, most left-wing Garrisonians. So Parker Pillsbury uh, and his close friend, Abby Kelly Foster, they, uh, these are who I call moral purists. And they said, no, we should not abandon the old ways because we still believe that moral ends require moral means. If you compromise, if you, if you engage, try to use you know, imperfect means to your moral ends, first off, you won't succeed because perfection requires perfect means. You'll just fail. But also all you'll do is corrupt yourself in the process. You'll lose yourself you'll lose sight of some of your goals and you'll destroy the movement. So this became gradually replaced the, not at first, not, you know, not totally. There were the people, Garrisonians and the Garrisonians, you know, there were a lot and Garrisonians and non-Garrisonians had a lot of, uh, you know, personal gripes against each other. So it didn't disappear immediately once the war started, but this, my book talks about how this divide, new dividing line between interventionists and moral purists gradually replaced that. So pretty much by, you know, the fall of 1861, that was the dividing line among abolitionists. Mm -hmm. It didn't really matter, honestly, if you were a Garrisonian or non-Garrisonian a year earlier. Right. It's like, it's a totally new world <laughs> that mm -hmm. you all of a sudden have there. Um, <clears throat> I, as you were talking, I actually, um, I want to get to sort of historiographical questions in a second, but as you were talking, it also seemed like um, there's sort of that frustration, obviously, by the late 1850s, like it, it, like you have been agitating for emancipation for, in Garrison's case, 25 years, and it doesn't seem to matter. No one pays much attention to you. They all think you're crazy. Um, 
And then there's this, like, like the declaration of sentiments and you have all these like, like goals that they're debating of like, even like women's rights of should we like, like Caddy Stanton, should we like expand the, like the struggle for freedom for with regard to gender. Um, and I kind of wondered as you were talking of like how much, how much are we engaging and are abolitionists engaging in these debates because precisely they are not in power and they are not involved politically. So they don't have like these these pressures politicians have to kind of think about a re-election of satisfying different parts of a, of a of their electorate. And sort of they're for lack of a better word, they're kind of academically arguing for a about a better United States, but they don't really have the pressures of implementing it, right? Yes, that's most definitely true. And it's also uh, to them, you know, on the eve of the Civil War in January 1860, it's not only academic, but theoretical because well, yeah. <laughs> most of them don't believe that abolition, the end of slavery is going to happen in the lives of their grandchildren, much less during their own lives. So uh, it is an entirely theoretical you know, uh, construction to try and understand how we're going to perfect the union. Uh, and as a consequence of that, because they don't, uh, right. So you mentioned uh, Garrison's declaration of sentiments. That was, you know, mm -hmm. one of the, the manifesto kind of, of when he founded the American anti-slavery society in 1833. Uh, and in it, he essentially lays the, the two main goals, lays out the two main goals of the abolitionist movement. We want immediate emancipation now we want uh, rights for African Americans. Again, he doesn't specify what rights those are, but those are the two goals, right? Emancipation and post-emancipation black rights. But the fact that they don't expect emancipation to occur in their lifetimes means <laughs> most of them haven't really thought about the post-emancipation issue, right. right? Because they don't need to. If emancipation is 50 years away, well, you know, right. it's just a, a far off problem that our children can think about. Right. And there are exceptions. People like Frederick Douglass and Wendell Phillips were talking mm -hmm. about it well before the Civil War, but uh, people like Garrison were not. They hadn't really thought about it in detail. And this uh, this becomes problematic when the war forces them to think about it because it reveals that, you know, they're all united. They all want immediate emancipation. But beyond that, they actually uh, have quite a bit of differences that have been masked up to that point. Yeah, uh, that was that was another question for later too that I want to explore a little bit with you and yeah the declaration of sentiments will come back as well sure uh, some thoughts on that but um, let's talk about um, the historiography because you already mentioned uh, James McPherson and you have him in your um, in a few places in your book but I also noticed um, you mentioned a, a few times Kate Maser and then also um, what's his first name here Stephen Oakes. Uh, works James Oaks. sorry yes James Oaks I, I interviewed him <laughs> uh, gosh two years ago when his new book on um, the um, anti-slavery constitution mm -hmm. came out mm -hmm. and um, I found it really refreshing because you kind of like they're all a lot of scholars these days have said like Lincoln was like even if he didn't say it if he didn't kind of his actions didn't present that he was anti-slavery but you came to seem to indicate that, especially the abolitionists, when they looked at Lincoln's actions, they were like, "No, this man is not anti-slavery. He's is he is everything but that." Um, do you do you feel like these other historians have overstepped sort of the evidence, or is it that when when we look at the perceptions of abolitionists, that that's just how Lincoln came off? What? How how would you how would you think of this like the debates that you're kind of creating with these other scholars? Yeah, I mean their their books. I mean James Oakes's new book is they're they're fantastic. I mean they're just like, really right. mark an important piece of Kate Major's uh, scholarship as well. Uh, I do enter into a healthy debate with them, but I don't think there's anything in terms of overstepping. I think we just have uh, different interpretations of. Uh, of Lincoln. Mm -hmm. uh, that is one of the, the main things uh, historiographically that I, that I'm involved in. Um, mm -hmm. One of the three things, I mean, the others are, are that there's a lot, I mentioned this a bit earlier. There's a lot on, of books on, of scholarship on abolitionism, but most don't get into the civil war years. They, mm -hmm. they kind of just focus on Lincoln and the Republicans and not so much on the abolitionists during the war years. And mm -hmm. I think that's a mistake. Mm 
Um, and you mentioned this a bit earlier, Niels, but the, the few books that are written on it, uh, they kind of portray abolitionists as unalloyed success stories. And I also try to dispute that. But yeah, what, what you're talking about is this idea that uh, the the in Lincoln administration, Lincoln in particular, had these very thoroughly anti-slavery motivations from the start mm -hmm. and were calculating to bring about emancipation from almost the start of the war, which which makes the emancipation process seem kind of inexorable. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not alone in, in trying focusing more on Lincoln as a political tactician. I mean, there are a lot of mm -hmm. historians who are doing this, sure. Richard Carradine, uh, Paul Escott, uh, Dan, mm -hmm. Dan Profts. I've looked yeah. at Lincoln as someone who is personally anti-slavery, but is above all a political strategist and a tactician mm -hmm. who understands his goal is to uphold the constitution and to only move on public sentiment and the, mm -hmm. you know, pot and the political capital within his party allows him to do so. And he's not going to do so either until mm -hmm. it becomes clear that moving against slavery will help preserve the constitution and win the mm -hmm. war. Uh, that doesn't mean that he was not anti-slavery. I personally, he was, but right. he understood his his role the as commander of the Constitution and commander in chief yeah. of the army. It was, and as the political leader of the Republican Party, because as a politician, his goal <laughs> is to maintain popularity and win re-election. That has yeah. not changed <laughs> no. in over 150 years. So, well, yeah. and I so think that's. I, I, that's sort of the dilemma we are facing with Lincoln of like how like like he like I, I think you say that very frequently going back to your roots of Jefferson right you can turn Jefferson into pretty much anything you want because he has said something about any subject matter like I, I think it was in a religion book that you can turn Jefferson into anything just not into a religious man or a Christian um, and that sort of applies with Lincoln too that he has sort of this he, he's a politician. He he has to be very cautious about the things he does and man, uh, maneuvers the landscapes that he is facing politically. Yeah, um, um, I, I will say, like, and I actually this this idea comes from originally from one of uh, James Oakes's earlier books, The Radical and the mm -hmm. Republican. Like the how Lincoln in the lat later years of the war ha evinces this this moral growth and really becomes not only just for you know for political reasons, a defender of emancipation and eventually black rights, but really is morally dedicated to it in the later mm -hmm. years. That is certainly something I subscribe to, but um, I do uh, regarding whether I think, you know, Lincoln, what his actual motivations were, or whether it's just established perceptions. Um, I do agree with the abolitionists when they talk about early in the war, essentially that, mm -hmm. It was the war was not a war against slavery and would not become a war against slavery right. unless they got involved, right? It mm -hmm. was the so I mean we'll we'll probably talk about this a little later, but it was the interventionists, these people mm -hmm. who had warmed a bit to the Republicans, Garrison, Phillips, Douglas, who said essentially is yeah it's not going to become a abolition war unless we make it so unless we get involved and help turn the tide and convince you know bring raise the tide of public opinion. Uh, garner political capital and help Lincoln see that, you know, it's uh, politically and uh, it's politically feasible to do this as well as a necessary measure to win the war. So I, I do think that they're they're correct in that respect. And they they did play an essential role in making emancipation happen. So I don't think they were just uh, blowing things out of proportion there. They they definitely blow things out of proportion for <laughs> Lincoln. Uh, later on, like during the election of 1864, we'll get there. Uh, they're not, uh, they're not oh, rash, totally rational all the time. But like, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think their 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 assessment of the the landscape, the political landscape, and at the start of the war in uh, April 1861 is is pretty accurate. Yeah, well, I I I personally think that too, based on sort of my reading of things. But I'm glad I'm we're in agreement on that. Um, the other part that um, I kind of want to change direction before we get into Garrison and the politics is that I was really stuck. I mean, I, I always knew sort of like the, there, there's this very strong religious aspect with regard to the moralism and the yep. underpinnings of abolition and some of its um, most important leadership. But then you had these like um, two words or two phrases really that struck out to me like um there was in one case 
Um, I think one of the abolitionists called it American Armageddon that was going on. And another one called it um, sort of a fight for the beacon of democracy. And um, having just finished a book on um, the United States sort of countering the exceptionalist narrative of the United States myself was a co-author, um, those terms really stuck sort of as as exceptionalists that the, the abolitionists sort of think like, oh, the United States needs us to save it and save its like it, it's it's its soul um, so that it can be for the world sort of this shiny city on the hill. Um, and it struck me odd and weird because abolitionism is, uh, sorry, abolitionism is this very transatlantic movement with its close ties between American abolitionists, U.S. abolitionists, and British abolitionists. So it's like, uh, can you clarify it a little bit for me? That is, are they kind no, of it just certainly this... is. Yeah, yeah. It's certainly sorry. Yeah, it's but it certainly is weird and paradoxical, and also because I mean, there are abolitionists who are actual you know preachers and clergymen who have for for years before the Civil War said Garrison was just this you know anti-religious heretic. But all of them <laughs> subscribe to these same views. Right. Uh, so essentially, Garrison was against organized religion, but all of these people had a deep, deep uh, sense of spiritualism and of providentialism and, mm -hmm. and of American exceptionalism. Right. So the idea was that the United States was divinely ordained mm -hmm. by God. Uh, this is, you know, Protestant millenarian tones right. all the way, grounded in revivalism, all that. Uh you know, God had ordained the, the the United States as the this beacon of democracies for the world to light the way and uh, fight the forces of oppression in Europe and the old world. Uh, and the Declaration of Independence embodied this promise. But in the years after 1776, it became corrupted. It lost its way mm -hmm. and they had to restore it so that it could true it could attain its true mantle, its true destiny as this this beacon of democracy. Uh, so that's that term uh, American Armageddon. So the, uh, these interventionists, uh, when they became frustrated in the 1850s, they began to believe that there needed to be some sort of apoc that there was, uh, some sort of divine wrath coming, um, mm -hmm. some sort of providential reckoning, uh, and that this apocalyptic moment, this Armageddon would be necessary to really wake up the United States, the, mm -hmm. the union out of its stupor and to really like create this cleansing, purifying revolution that would end in a morally transformed yeah. union. Uh, this, you know, they referred to it as American Armageddon, as apocalypse, but most often they referred to it as what they called their golden moment. So mm -hmm. these interventionists were looking for this golden moment. And when the war started in 18, April 1861, they thought an abolition war would be that golden moment. If we can just get milit if we could just get emancipation to become a union war aim, that'll create that revolution that'll sweep away uh, slavery and racial prejudice and it will create mm. a moral paradise and everything will be great. Obviously a little right. you know not not <laughs> not not totally accurate there. Right. But uh that that was what they meant by uh mm. American Armageddon. Uh and it is paradoxical because there are a lot of British abolitionists and Irish yeah. abolitionists, um, people like George Thompson, Richard Davis yeah. Webb, uh, who were very, who were part of the abolitionist movement. It was transatlantic, and they also believed in this idea of American exceptionalism. It doesn't mean that they were, you know, viewed the United States as more important than Britain. I mean, George Thompson was an MP. John was an MP, but they did believe that the United States held great promise, and it could uh, be at the forefront of a wave of liberalization in Europe. Hopefully, mm. alongside Great Britain, after you know re various reforms, the lower pass and the uh, American abolitionists were supported them, you know, chartism, right. uh, various other things in the 1830s and 40s. But yeah, um, the it was a bit confusing to me, and I didn't really expect to see that these British and Irish abolitionists subscribe to this American exceptionalism, right. but I mean, they did. Um, I, uh, in my book, I include a quote from one of them, an MP, uh, radical, you know, abolitionist named John Bright, who said, we know what your great free republic means on your continent and also in Europe, and they, the that the extension of freedom with you would also do its extension here, right? right. So they they firmly subscribe to this idea that if the United States became this morally transformed union, it would help Britain right. and Europe as well. And I mean, we 
my co-author Duncan Campbell would he has a very <laughs> um low opinion of Bright and Copton, but like, <laughs> and, and we, on on both sides, right? Like abolitionists in the United States and Britain, we're not talking large groups. We're talking about a small number of people that Extremely are small. yeah, that are just very active, very very much out there in the public light and that draw more attention than their numbers ever justify, but in at least the US case successfully. Um, yeah. I mean I've I've sometimes been asked to like put like a number, a percentage of how many people are abolitionists, and I, I have no idea, but not a lot yeah. is the answer. Not not a lot. Yeah. I, I, gosh, I think my <laughs> you're taking me back to like my undergrad. I think my history teacher in Civil War history was trying to give us numbers and just was like it's it's cho- it's super small and I, I don't remember the percentage he tried to attach. It's it's, it's not a lot. It, it isn't. Um, but it is uh, one of the fascinating things. I not to go off on a too far, but uh, you know, after the war, after emancipation is achieved, mm-hmm. um, and and being an abolitionist is popular, pretty much everyone who said okay. that who who had either been an abolitionist or had just gone to like one anti-slavery meeting for five yeah. minutes said that they yeah. were an abolitionist and I led the charge against slavery. So suddenly everyone was an abolitionist, but when it was actually unpopular, when they were actually being attacked by mobs, uh, and no one uh, was no, pretty much no one was. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of like the, the American revolution, right? After the revolution, everyone is a patriot, but when it starts, it's not. And like everyone is a, whatever football team goes to the Super Bowl fan or, was that a couple hours and it's before pretty, that it's a pretty common thing and it's yeah. also like uh after a presidential election yeah like two-thirds of people said they voted for the winning candidate yeah generally you're like how is that possible yeah. <laughs> uh, but yes that's a perfect segue over into um politics um because most of your book revolves around politics and um one of the big challenges that you are chronicling in the book is that should abolitionists get involved in politics or not and um let's just stick with that for the first part because there's a lot of layers that we kind of have to peel back when it comes to the political involvement but um why or why not should they engage Mm and how in politics yeah so um we'll talk late more later about the divide between interventionists and moral purists. So just say moral purists definitely didn't want to get involved and were very upset that <laughs> other people did want to get involved. But the interventionists, and again, abolitionists, not a large group, but of this small group, the vast majority of abolitionists in the United States are interventionists. Mm-hmm. Garrison, Phillips, Douglas, uh, other names I talk about in my book, like Moncure Conway, mm-hmm. Lydia Marie Child, George Cheever, both Garrisonians and non-Garrisonians. Um, these people are really facing an outbreak uh, dilemma at the outbreak of war you know, after the fall of Fort Sumter in April 1861, because they understand that this war is a real opportunity to achieve emancipation. You know, the North mm-hmm. is at uh, the Union is at war with Confederacy. Most of the northern states are at war with most of the southern states. Mm-hmm. So, if we can somehow turn this into a war for emancipation again, it would be a golden moment. We might achieve all our goals, um, but. Lincoln is not really helping with that. They think it's their job to help turn the tide of public mm-hmm. and opinion, political opinion. They have to do it. But the question is how to do so, right? They've Their tactics of the last 30 years have not been working, right? People are not listening to them. So how to get people to listen? And the mm-hmm. only way, and they kind of hit on this because of what they saw Benjamin Butler doing at Fort Monroe, where he was taking mm-hmm. in uh, fugitive slaves and declaring them contraband of war. And essentially couching anti-slavery action in the language of expediency uh, Mm. that made abolitionists realize they had to overhaul their entire strategies their and in sense their their entire senses of being to to transform the abolitionist movement from a kind of moral reform movement into a political interest group Uh, they had to start appealing to the north uh, through these innovative arguments that didn't present emancipation just as an act of justice but as as an act of expediency to appeal mm-hmm. to Northerners in their own language and say <laughs> emancipation is a necessity to win the war. And not only that, but we have an easy way to do it. Uh, the war powers clause of the U S constitution. Mm-hmm. And this is again, a pretty astounding turnaround. 
for these abolitionists, especially for these uh, Garrisonians like William Lloyd Garrison, who had viewed the Constitution as pro-slavery, right? Like yeah. five years yeah. earlier, Garrison had burned <laughs> the Constitution on stage at an abolitionist gathering at the Fourth, uh, a Fourth of July gathering. And now all of a sudden he's publishing pamphlets and other things saying we should use <laughs> this clause of the U.S. Constitution as our instrument yeah. to end slavery. It's a pretty remarkable and astonishing turnaround. And not only that, not only should we be totally changing our messaging, but we should also be descending from our, you know, from the high aloof clouds and allying with mainstream political parties, with people mm -hmm. who are morally beneath us, who are in the halls of power so that they could spread our message and it can gain popularity. Yeah. Um, and again, these, this was a really difficult thing to do. But, the, yeah. uh, for example, Wendell Phillips. Uh, gave a speech in April 1861 in Boston, and a few we uh, right after the fall of sorts, Fort Sumter. A few weeks earlier, he had been uh, decrying the Union as evil and pro-slavery. Now all of a sudden, uh, uh, the Union's at war. Lincoln has called for troops. Everyone's rallying into Union Blue. Abolitionists mm -hmm. had not really expected this, but they see it happening and they adjust and they adapt. Right. And Lincoln uh, Phillips essentially uh, is about to give this big speech uh, and he talks to his confidant, his future son-in-law before and says, am I really about to, you know, renounce my entire past, my past 30 years and totally change my identity? Uh, and he does. He goes out on a stage that's covered in American flags and says, I support the union war. I'm with stand with president Lincoln and we must defeat the rebels. So he, he really does. Uh, it really does change everything. But there is uh, a risk to that. And the reason partly why Phillips was so worried uh, and that these worries continue in these interventionists throughout the first years of the war uh, is that they're descending into the muck, right? They're descending mm -hmm. from their Olympian heights. Uh, and they view themselves as, as saints, right? They believe they were on these Olympian heights of purity, <laughs> regardless if it's true or not. And they would have to descend into the muck. Uh, but in a more practical and real sense, they would have to risk their radical values by allying with politicians who did not share those values, right? And mm -hmm. the risk of doing that is that you might just become uh, satisfied, complacent in this political mainstream and lose sight mm -hmm. of some of your more radical goals and values, the things that were less expedient and less accepted by the politicians. Mm -hmm. And that really did create this, this kind of palpable anxiety and anguish that these interventionists felt mm -hmm. throughout the first years of the war. They they were trying to balance their their personal moral ideals, which hadn't changed, right? They still had the same goals, emancipation, post-emancipation black rights. And they're trying to balance that with the necessities of pressure politics, with, with publicly right. talking about how great Lincoln is, with talking about expediency and not justice. Uh, and it really created essentially a total... Uh, total split between what these abolitionists would say in public mm. and what they would believe and say in private in their own letters to each other in their diaries regarding Lincoln. I mean, in, yeah. in public, people like Garrison and Phillips would talk about how, you know, Lincoln was great and they totally supported him. And in private, uh, they said various things, including <laughs> that he was a pro-slavery puppet, that he was an imbecile, that he was evil. Yeah. <laughs> it was just yeah. uh, ran the gamut. Uh, some of them were contradictory because one person, you know, he can't be both a puppet and and you know uh, evil mastermind. Well, but, uh, you kind of, it's almost like it sounds like oh, like like was one of your people like a few weeks earlier you criticized and now you're standing and you're fully embracing it. You you could be called hypocritical in in like what you're doing. That like what's your true identity? Are you just or like yeah well, yeah? It, it's I mean, it's just have, convenient for you right now to do. They essentially understood uh and i think correctly that was a, a like supporting the war was a means to an end and it was mm -hmm. not like their end like, this is a thing i also engage in in terms of scholarship their end was not just you know emancipation and and black rights they wanted to save the union right mm -hmm. in a moral sense they wanted uh, in a providential sense and they believed this was the way to do it so we just have to side we just have to muzzle we have to muffle our uh our private and personal qualms and just stand with the war because we can better harness it and we can better turn and steer Lincoln toward emancipation from the inside than from the outside. You mm -hmm. know, you're not going to achieve anything at this point as a gadfly. You have to work from the inside. And I think that was a, 
a pretty you know practical and pragmatic understanding which isn't something that uh, we see often when you know, historians talk about abolitionists. You know, they're often depicted as just these high-minded idealists with their heads in the mm-hmm. clouds. These, these people were dynamic uh, strategists, and they mm-hmm. they understood uh, that they had to change, and they did. And I think they mm-hmm. did so to great effect. So I, I will complicate now because one of mm-hmm. the interesting parts too that you mentioned in your book is that they then go into an alliance with the radical Republicans and. Yeah. Um, they see a lot of similarities, especially as the war con- uh, emerges. And you you very clearly note that radical Republicans and abolitionists are not the same. And Charles Sumner is sort of your example in that regard. Um, but it's it's really interesting to see this evolution throughout the the book, where you, you kind of start. This is sort of an alliance they're building. They're um, the the abolitionists are good to kind of give. Um, are are using these radical Republicans to kind of get publicity out, and then it turns, and the abolitionists are the ones that pull along the radical Republicans, and then you get to the point where it turns again, and it's the clear. It it felt like the clear situation emerges that this is for radical Republicans seemed like it was just a alliance of convenience for them rather than an ideological like we're on the same page situation. I think it was in many ways in a life of convenience, but there were a lot of ideological similarities. So again, I sure radical Republicans shared with abolitionists belief in immediate emancipation and black rights. Like I'm not mm-hmm. questioning at all that people like Charles Sumner wanted black equality yeah. and that is Stevens. They did, but mm-hmm. they were also part of this mainstream political party and they do it had to adhere to its dictates. Mm-hmm. And, as politicians, they followed followed the political headwinds wherever it went. Um, so, mm-hmm. you know, only when things were politically feasible and palatable would they take that ground in a lot of mm-hmm. cases. Um, and that was a big that that did make abolitionists sometimes not allies com- of convenience when things were less feasible right. and palatable. Um, so, yeah, I talk about after the bat- uh, first bull run in July 1861. The abolitionists had created this alliance. They um, this what I call an anti-slavery alliance. They they bridged the gaps between you know people like Garrison and and Frederick Douglass within the abolitionists, but they realized they have to reach out further and they reach out to radical Republicans and they do mm-hmm. work together. And at first, yeah, it's the uh, radical Republicans are the guys in the positions of power. So abolitionists use the radical Republicans to spread their ideas and uh, to great effect. I mean, probably the biggest example I talk about in my book is Moncure Conway, this mm-hmm. really fascinating was figure. Fascinating. Hopefully get a chance to talk about him later. Um, yeah. He, uh, with Wendell Phillips's help, reaches out to Charles Sumner and says, I'm trying to write a book, uh, but the publishers don't want me. Could you put in a good word? And Charles Sumner essentially engineers it, totally steers it to publication mm-hmm. with, with the press and, and helps him. And yeah, really guiding light and getting the book published. Um and this, so th- that's in the uh, fall of 1861. But uh, as abolitionist arguments uh, and alliances uh, catch on, you know, the, the war is going on without an end in sight and more people want are getting wary and are just looking for anything. What can uh, uh, accelerate Union victory and bring mm-hmm. our sons and brothers and, and uh, fathers home? Uh and so the abolitionists' arguments, as spread by their political allies, become really popular and mm-hmm. something that no one expected to see happen. These abolitionists become celebrities. William Lloyd Garrison, yeah. you know, the guy who was chased by a mob a few years earlier, all of a sudden <laughs> is now speaking to adoring crowds. Uh, yeah. Frederick Douglass, uh, too. Uh, Wendell they come Phillips. to Washington, right? They're, yeah. they're invited to speak in Washington. Wendell Phillips and Moncure Conway and another guy, George Cheever, are invited to the speak in a lecture series at the Smithsonian and then speak on the floor of Congress Yeah, and meet Lincoln at the White House. I mean, it's a really astonishing turnaround. Uh, but as a result, re- radical Republicans realize, you know, it's not uh, the, the kind of balance, the p- dynamics of power in this relationship shift because mm-hmm. they realize, wait a minute, we should latch on to the abolitionist celebrity, not the other way around. We mm-hmm. should ask, hey, I just like gave a speech on the floor of the Senate. Could you please publish it in your abolitionist mm-hmm. newspaper? Could you please come campaign for us? Which yeah. actually happens. Yeah. Uh, George Cheever, who I mentioned a bit earlier, he's a Congregationalist preacher uh, from New York. Uh, 
and uh, Republicans in uh, Pennsylvania actually asked him to come and uh, speak in the the Pennsylvania, you know, state legislature, mm -hmm. help bolster embattled Republicans in their electoral fight and come help them out. Mm -hmm. uh, and other re Republicans ask uh, a new star on the scene, Anna Dickinson from Pennsylvania, really mm -hmm. a young firebrand abolitionist, to come help out in elections in New Hampshire and mm -hmm. Connecticut and other places to help the Republicans. So suddenly abolitionists are like prized political assets. And Celebrities like, almost, right? <laughs> yeah, it's it's insane. But uh, essentially, uh, not to cut things too short, but the abolitionists, this alliance works and abolitionists, these interventionists really do help push the level of, of public sentiment and political mm -hmm. sentiment for emancipation up and do help achieve the Emancipation Proclamation. But there's not much of a public appetite to go beyond that. Uh, mm -hmm. And so radical Republicans initially, you know, in the early months of 1863, especially are not for all of their strongly anti-slavery and egalitarian beliefs, aren't really looking to go further. So when these interventionists, some of them want to go further, uh, they kind of uh, rebuff them. Uh, and there's a lot of tension. I mean, the most famous example is there's an abolitionist talk about in my book named James Miller McKim, who uh, goes down to the Sea Islands with you know newly emancipated slaves and realizes we should have some type of a Freedmen's Aid Commission, something to that effect, and wants to work with Charles Sumner to do it. And Charles Sumner says, that's a great idea. Uh, they work together. McKim says, you know, once this commission is created, I want to be the secretary. And he, Sumner says, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, he doesn't hear about it for months, thinks the project's dead. He writes to a friend and uh, saying, you know, it's a shame this thing died. And the guy said, oh, it's not dead. I'm the new secretary of the commission. It was created the other week. So they just totally sidelined this abolitionist because they just decided it was inexpedient yeah. for the time being. Yeah, it's uh, it's yeah, the stories you found were were fascinating in so many regards and um in part we don't want to give all of them away so people actually have no. to buy your book um <laughs> now i i kind of want to go into uh, the other direction because you're already kind of hinting in the direction now of um the, the, the growing struggles in once lincoln's emancipation proclamation is in place of the next stage and what what rights and um will there be racial equality and it's sort of Correct me if I'm wrong, but there were parts where it felt like that your abolitionists were kind of worried that by hastening along the process of emancipation, um, it would also sort of undermine um, the call us for equality for African Americans, that um, going too fast, um, not preparing people right, um, could backfire on them. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh... I think that's true. I I don't I'm not sure they articulate it so much, but I do think the the fact the achievement of emancipation does lead to the collapse of the uh, abolitionist movement and the strife over black rights, and that leads mm -hmm. to what I call the the so little in this equation of achieving so much and so mm -hmm. little, um, because their victory essentially begets their failure. So I, I talk about the this division between interventionists and moral purists during the first first years of the war, and uh, to just you know, in in brief, it's a division over the means to a moral union, how to achieve it. Mm -hmm. But it, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, emancip the the common fight for emancipation is masking these differences among a lot of abolitionists over what's after what comes after. What do black rights mm -hmm. after actually mean? Uh, and it turns out in the first years of the war, you know, bubbling beneath the surface because there's still this common fight uh, mm -hmm. within among the interventionists, it turns out there is a pretty big difference of opinion on this. On So it's not over the means to a moral union. It's what does an immoral union actually look like? What's it actually mean? Uh, and this division is among who I call narrow interventionists and, and broad interventionists. So narrow mm -hmm. is people like William Lloyd Garrison, especially Moncure, Moncure Conway, who never really thought much about Black rights before mm -hmm. the war. Uh, as they do start to think about it, they take on a, a pretty restrictive sense of what it means mm -hmm. uh so you know things like free plantation wage labor and then you have your broad interventionists people like wendell phillips william lloyd garrison who have a much more expansive view they um they come to you know incorporate the language of politics and believe we need full uh legislated equality in the mm -hmm. post-war era so full political civil socioeconomic equality 
So again, these differences are buried initially in this common fight for emancipation, but once it's achieved, once you have to look to the post-emancipation landscape, then it, it comes to the fore. And this is where um, this, idea, this, this warning that purists had all along about how politics can corrupt and, uh, and, and hurt the cause, this is where it comes into play. Because these narrow interventionists, like Garrison especially, do become kind of swept up in mainstream politics and do mm -hmm. start to moderate their interests. So uh, yeah. he obviously never... He always firm, firmly supports immediate emancipation, but he starts to to pare away this idea of black rights at all. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, by the end of the war, he's saying that post-emancipation black rights are essentially irrelevant to the abolitionist mission. It'd be nice if they happen, but they're not part of my cause. They're not what I have to do. And they don't they're uh, just emancipation will make a morally transformed union. Right. If we achieve mm -hmm. emancipation and the union wins, we've got a morally transformed union. I can retire. The job is done. We can pack up and go home. Whereas people like uh, Phillips and Douglas say like, no, uh, the mission of abolitionism is to achieve emancipation right. and black rights, which for them very clearly now means, you know, total full equality. So that creates this massive division. Uh, the political, uh, the election of 1864 colors it. And there's a lot we could talk about there, but in some garrison, declares his mission accomplished after the 13th Amendment and the Union victory, uh, tries to disband the American Anti-Slavery Society, the leading society of abolitionism, because he says organized abolitionism is the mission's over. Uh, he uh, tries to lead a vote to disband the society and fails, but on failing, he and his followers leave. They abandon the society and retire, and in doing so, really abandon those abolitionists who do want to fight for equality leave them without the the numbers, the influence, the resources that the wartime movement had and really uh, really uh, neuters their ability to help achieve change and and secure black equality. So that that is the 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 paradox uh, of my yeah. book. essentially, abolitionists could not have achieved helped achieve emancipation or accomplished anything politically right. without getting involved. But by doing so, they essentially ultimately obstructed their ability to achieve anything beyond. <laughs> It is it, it it when 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 I read that it so reminded me of like uh, George W. Bush and his speech on the aircraft carrier of mission accomplished Iraq war is over and then it's two years of fighting that follows to stabilize the country and it's like it, um, but you I, I I'm glad I was going to do that later but uh, we're also getting towards the end here time wise um, you had this beautiful. Um, statement in your book and i'm going to read that because i found this was just it's, it's so on point also of what you just said um you said you wrote um garrison was effectively rewriting his declaration of sentiments which had made black inclusion a concurrent and co-equal demand of abolitionism alongside emancipation now he expunged it from his agenda past and present especially singling out the idea of black suffrage now it, it just it I thought that totally encapsulated exactly what you're just saying, that um, Garrison, the leading voice, the lightning rock of the abolitionist movement, all of a sudden is like, mission accomplished, we're done, let's go home, mm -hmm. and let's mm -hmm. let, let the freedmen worry for themselves about their future. Like, it, 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 it so seems like the... Uh, if you believe in reconstruction as a failure, it seems like that exact argument in a nutshell. Yeah. And um, he, he was again, one of the people who never really thought too much about black rights right. before the war. So he was never <laughs> one Phillips in that sense, but he had written in this declaration of sentiments that had made, you know, rights for African-Americans. Yeah. One of the two goals of abolitionism. And when he suddenly was saying it, he, was saying at the end of the Civil War repeatedly, uh, this was never a goal of abolitionism at all. It was just emancipation. Uh, a lot of people, Wendell Phillips, uh, Frederick Douglass, African, other African-American abolitionists uh, like George Downing would constantly remind him, you wrote this declaration of yeah. consent that directly contradicts what you're saying right now. Yeah. And, uh, so Uncomfortable um, moment right there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think partly, I mean, Garrison certainly did not see it as a betrayal in any sense. I mean, right. you do. He had been fighting for thirty years, uh, and he was 
I mean, all these people were incredibly egotistical, but uh, this is an idea that I actually got from uh, one of my mentors, James Brewer Stewart, that he essentially saw uh, his own personal struggles and foibles as uh, pretty much uh, the embodiment, the manifestation of the abolitionist movement. So the fact that mm. he personally became popular and triumphant uh, and was in fact invited in April 1865 to the re ceremony re-raising the federal flag at Fort mm -hmm. Sumter, which I mean, the symbolism of that, this it's big. This, <laughs> he's invited to a ceremony in the cradle of secession, like this radical abolitionist. He sees his, like the fact that he has personally triumphed as signifying mm -hmm. the triumph of the abolitionist movement. Like there are obvious there are massive blind spots in that, and everyone pointed it out, and it was like an abandonment. Uh, yeah. but he he certainly did not see himself as as you know. Right. I, mean, I, I kind of like as you're talking, I kind of was thinking I, I met uh, when I saw Nick Saban at Alabama retired recently and I wrote to a friend. I was like, oh, so he retired. So he doesn't have to deal with Texas and University of Oklahoma in the future. And it's sort of like, oh, it's over. I, I kind of never lost, <laughs> um, like never had to worry about the big game that went away from me. And um, it, it sounds like Garrison is somewhat like that here in the moment that like he has accomplished one of his goals emancipation now there's still like the whole what what do you do with the rights of the freedmen and that would be another 20 or 30 years of struggle and he's mm -hmm. just he's probably tired of like i've i can't say i accomplished one goal i'm done he absolutely yeah he absolutely is tired uh but in instead of you know supporting at least from afar the the continued rump abolitionist movement he just totally <laughs> denigrates it again and again, says like, they're, they're, our mission's over, this is irrelevant, uh, and spends quite a bit of time trying to burnish his own legacy. I won't I won't reveal all this <laughs> stuff, but there's, there's some pretty juicy stuff yeah. that he says yeah. as he tries it's, to talk about how his, his own legacy in history. Yeah. Um, so very briefly, um, since we're almost at an hour mark by this point, um, 1864 election and what I guess we can call abolitionist shooting themselves for the struggle for civil rights for African Americans um, because that it was a fascinating chapter I, I I had briefly looked at it in my own book Liberty and Slavery because of some Euro Germans that were involved in this Cleveland movement but it just it seems like everything went wrong yeah so uh I don't want to get too into the, the weeds of all the differences and uh, stuff. Uh, so essentially during the few, first years of the war up to the Emancipation Proclamation, the division is between interventionists and moral purists. Uh, when you get uh, to the end of the war, by the very end, when you're fighting over whether the anti-slavery societies should continue, you've got uh, on one side narrow interventionists who don't want it to, like Garrison. On the other side, you got broad interventionists like Phillips and Douglas who have joined with moral purists like Parker Pillsbury and Abby Kelly Foster, they pretty much are on the same page at this point and saying, yeah, we were okay with using, you know, some sort of political activism, but we want full equality. And that, that uh, so they're on the side of continuation. Mm -hmm. uh, in the middle, it becomes a bit muddled and confusing, but just in broad strokes, uh, narrow interventionists over the course of 1863, 64, like Garrison, come to see Lincoln as the embodiment of their goals of union victory and total emancipation. Uh, and they're, they're moderated goals, I should say. In some ways, maybe uh, going in opposite directions from Lincoln as he moves toward black rights, they're they're pairing it off. Mm -hmm. uh, and they become essentially partisans for Lincoln in the 1864 election. Um, Full-fledged partisans engaging in political politicking. Uh, Garrison actually attends Lincoln's renomination uh, convention at Baltimore in 1864 yeah. and goes to meet uh, Lincoln at the White House after. Um, whereas broad interventionists uh, and moral purists uh, increasingly come to see Lincoln as an obstacle to uh -huh. their to their goal of post-emancipation black rights. Uh, and again, for them, that means specifically equality. Yeah. Uh and by the end of 1863, the interventionist camp uh, collapses in spectacular fashion. Garrison and Phillips, lifelong friends and, you know, key allies during the years of the war become bitter enemies. Mm -hmm. um, Garrison leads the pro-Lincoln camp, the pro-Lincoln partisans who are mostly narrow interventionists. There are some exceptions. Again, I, I don't want to bog down too much here. Uh, and Phillips 
leads the anti-Lincoln camp, which again, mostly narrow interventionists and moral purists. There are some exceptions and they engage in really, you know, heavy handed. It's nasty. <laughs> it's, it's really nasty politicking. Um, you Garrison, call it even a civil war that's like happening. Yeah, it's, so it's, it's a like, civil war it's, within yeah. the abolitionists. Yeah. So Garrison essentially starts defending Lincoln administration officials like Montgomery Blair, who will have a very checkered record on rights for African Americans. Oh, yeah. You had some and good statements total... on that. <laughs> yeah. Um, whereas uh, Phillips, uh, Parker Pillsbury, Abby Kelly Foster, uh, George Cheever, and, and briefly Frederick Douglass try to find an alternative candidate to, to take on Lincoln to become oh. the Republican nominee. Um, they eventually hit on, uh, they look at Benjamin Butler, for example, uh, they eventually hit on John C. Fremont, you know, the Pathfinder, 1856 Republican nominee, had issued an emancipation edict in Missouri in 1861. Very politically opportunistic, ambitious guy. Mm -hmm. They think he can be the Republican nominee. Turns out he can't. And so Fremont <laughs> essentially re-engineers uh, his, his movement into a, a third party. Um, I call it the Cleveland movement. But, uh, it, its formal name was the Radical Democracy Party, but uh, they had their Very commission. bad title, yeah. too. Yeah. I just they had their convention at Cleveland. So just for shorthand, I refer to it as the Cleveland movement, uh, Phillips and uh, very brief and all these guys and, and briefly Douglas support it uh, because at first it uh, appeals to high minded ideals. They talk about things like equality and appealing to abolitionists, but it becomes clear soon enough they're not getting enough tr sway that way. So they go the totally opposite direction and start appealing to copperhead Democrats by talking about oh, Lincoln's, that's... Lincoln's, you know, violations of civil liberties. Uh, and that's and, lights uh, out. And recruit a number of Democrats into the party. Um, Douglas says, I want nothing to do with this anymore, wisely, and backs away. But mm. Phillips and the others stay in. Um, not only stay in and defend Fremont all the way to the hilt, they start saying, maybe we should just openly ally with Copperhead Democrats because Lincoln is the great evil, right? They've totally, they've lost, they've, they've never, you know, Phillips has, and uh, Pillsbury and others have never diluted their goals, right? They still want total equality, but they've become a bit myopic and short-sighted. I mean, more than a bit in this moment saying, you know, becoming obsessed with defeating Lincoln saying like the only way we'll get these goals is to get rid of Lincoln. So we have to do whatever is necessary and even align with these people who are pro-slavery. Um, and this really, really damages their reputations, mm -hmm. uh, especially of Phillips. So the, the biggest example is, um, uh, William Lloyd Garrison had many sons. Uh, one of them was named Wendell Phillips Garrison, uh, obviously named after his friend Wendell Phillips. And Wendell Phillips is kind of, I mean, not uh, in a formal sense, but is informally his kind of godfather. He pays mm -hmm. his namesake's way through Harvard, uh, is, uh, you know, offers him advice throughout his life. And Wendell Phillips Garrison essentially uh, writes to, to Wendell Phillips in the middle of the election and says, I mean, to paraphrase, I'm, I'm ashamed to be named after you. So it's, so it creates, it, it's, it's really, bad. really damages its <laughs> reputation. And that's again, part of the reason of why abolitionists fail during reconstruction. I mean, the biggest yeah. reason is because Garrison is gone and has stripped him of the resources, but the people who are left like Phillips really have, uh, you know, kind of tarnished the reputations and, and they're influenced by what mm -hmm. they did there in the election. And that, that also plays a role. Wonderful. Oh, there, there's so much great stuff in your book, Frank. It's, it's incredible. So um, with that, um, if you are interested in Frank's book after this, The Abolitionist Civil War, Immediatist Answers Struggle to Transform the Union, it's available with LSU Press and a lot of other booksellers if you're wanting to go with some independent sellers. Um, it was a great pleasure to talk to you tonight. Um, thank you so much for joining me, Frank. Um, and I look forward to see what you come up with with um, abolitionist memory in the future at some point. Thanks, Nielsen. Thanks for having me. <laughs>